Today's session is featuring and focusing on the Lord's Supper. Sharing and Serving the Lord's Supper is the title of this particular panel. I'm delighted to be joined by my friend and colleague, Dr. Sue Roseboom, who is Associate Professor of Liturgical Theology at Western Theological Seminary in Holland, Michigan. I first got to know Sue when she worked at Calvin as the main assistant to Neil Plantinga, who served then as the Dean of the Chapel. She obtained her PhD from the University of Notre Dame. She is the co-author with Neil Plantinga of Discerning the Spirits, Understanding and Evaluating Contemporary Worship Practices. She will begin our session today with insights on Calvin's theology of the Lord's Supper, which was also the subject of her doctoral thesis and the subject of her ongoing research. So, Sue. Thank you, Corrine. Um, actually, I'm not going to focus on Calvin quite so much, but that's great. Um, I have the extra handouts, so I'll put those here. I'll keep this one. So the Lord's Supper in the Reformation era in 20 minutes. Fasten your seatbelts and hold on with a relaxed but ready grip. Here we go. Ultimately, the approach I would like to take in discussing different Reformation era doctrines of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper is a historical and a geographical approach. So this is why you have those three handouts. One is a map, and you can see it's color-coded according to some of the confessional traditions, the primary confessional traditions. And then another is what appears to be a very convoluted timeline. We'll sort that shortly. And then finally, um, a two-sided collection of quotations. Do you have more maps? We don't have the maps. The map. Oh. I did not get a map. Um, Let them look at the one over there. there. Yeah, I don't know. We could pass that chart around. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pass a marker with it. Kareen would be so thrilled. <laughs> no. Um, and then, and then, yes, this two-handed, two-sided one with a number of quotes. The 16th century uh, featured an unprecedented proliferation of the publication of words, words, words. So I thought I'd follow suit. The Lord's Supper, or communion, or the Eucharist, as it is variously called, is often referred to as the sacrament of the church's unity. Welcome, come on in. Though a history of Christianity would suggest that it is the sacrament of the church's disunity. During the Reformation era in the West, if you were to listen in on certain moments in disputations, you might wonder if you were at a real estate convention. Since theologians and pastors were going at it about location, location, location. And of course, their discussion wasn't about a pleasant vacation property, but about the presence of Christ. Everyone agrees Christ is present with respect to the sacrament, but how shall we apprehend, and I use this word intentionally, how shall we apprehend, yes, with our imagination or our intellect, but as well as with our experience, the presence of Christ with respect to the sacrament. Where is Christ present and how? And how is Christ present to us? The sacrament of the Lord's Supper bears many meanings. The presence of Christ is but one facet of its meaning and significance. And yet, this facet became the primary sticking point for agreement or disagreement in discussions and, yes, disputations about the sacrament. And it's important to note that these disputes were not just for the sake of ecclesial or churchly unity, but also for the sake of political alliance. So as you've heard during the last three sessions, the institutions of church and state in the 16th century were not separate anywhere in Europe in the 16th century. Uh, once movement toward reformation or reformations, as Dr. Birma helped us see yesterday, once those movements got rolling, leading theologians strove to agree for the sake of withstanding Catholic political pressure or Lutheran political pressure or other political confessional pressures. The last thing I want to say by way of introduction with respect to all of this is this. On the one hand, this divisiveness is deeply 
disconcerting. It's deeply lamentable that those who confess Christ could shed one another's blood over a sacrament about which Paul and these Christian traditions after him say, the bread which we break, is it not our sharing in the body of Christ? And the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not our sharing in the blood of Christ? So disconcerting. And yet, it seems to me we ought also to respect the sheer passion for the gospel that this profusion of theological ideas about the Lord's Supper expresses. So let's proceed with a little history and geography. So I invite you to pull out this handout, which you'll see roughly replicated here on the whiteboard. Um, Yesterday, Dr. Birma invited us to consider a continuum of divergence with regard to the primary confessional traditions in the 16th century. Divergence, that is, from the traditional, the medieval Roman Catholic church teaching and its practices. And if we, I mean, this is a little bit of a caricature, right? But caricatures work because there's elements of truth in them. If we if we put them on a continuum of divergence from conservative to radical, they fall out roughly Roman Catholic, Luther, and most of his followers, Calvin, Swingley, and then the Radical Reformation. But we would be making a very big mistake if we thought that this suggested some kind of chronological progression. You know, like, like a single individual grows, right? And their thought might change and grow and it might move from being very conservative to more and more radical. But that's not at all the picture we get when we think about the chronology of the Reformation itself. So what I invite you to do actually is look at this and notice the time, the, the dates go across the top, right? And I only put significant dates with regard to events or documents in the 16th century. But if you put lines straight down, so here's the beginning of the Reformation. Here's 1536. Kelvin isn't even on the scene. Kelvin is very definitely a second generation reformer. Prior to Kelvin, there's this massive proliferation of materials. And it's, it's really amazing to think about, and there's a book, I can't remember exactly who authored it, but um, Kelvin in the book, in the Reformation. Yes, Thank you. Um, it's a fascinating read because he talks about how it is that printing presses proliferated ideas. And I mean, this was social media in the 16th century. So slow. I mean, yesterday, Kareen showed us, Dr. Mogg showed us this prayer book. Tiny little print, and yet every one of those pages was manually set, right? So this barely glances even the surface of all of the materials that were published in the 16th century with respect to the Lord's Supper. And they just get proliferated and proliferated. It's amazing how ideas were trafficked, if you will, in the 16th century. But it begins in 1517. 1517, Luther posts his 95 theses. He's not a particularly prominent theologian in a very, not really a particularly prominent university. But he wants to start a discussion. He's not looking for reformation. He wants to start a discussion about practices that he's been observing, namely indulgences. And unwittingly, he inflames a movement. His ideas progress, and in 1519, he publishes what he calls the Babylonian captivity of the church. And he says the Roman, the Pope, and all the popery have held the Christian church in a Babylonian captivity. <laughs> and, and we need to be freed of this captivity. And his primary, um, his primary concerns, especially with respect to the mass um, in the Babylonian captivity, have to do with an understanding of the sacrament as sacrifice, 
an understanding of the presence of Christ as um, corporeal, uh, the doctrine of transubstantiation, um, the introduction of Aristotelian, ter the Aristotelian philosophical terms that aren't particularly biblical terms, but these are introduced in order to explain how is Christ present. So again, I mean, in the Middle Ages, even when this is all developing, on the one hand, we can say, oy vey, why are they doing this? Why introduce all these terms? But I think behind it, we have to give them the benefit of the doubt and recognize that this is devotional passion. This is devotional theological passion. Um, and of course, this, this gets him in hot water. And by 1520, um, he's declared a heretic and he's exiled from the church. Um, Melanchthon is his protege. And Melanchthon picks up, so um, the Diet of Worms is uh, Luther has one last chance to defend himself at the Diet of Worms. And he says, I can't do it. I mean, I can't recant. I can't take back what I've printed. I can't take back what I've said. Um, I believe the church needs reform. So um, on his way back to Wittenberg, friends scuttle him off to a castle in order to protect him. And while he's absent, Melanchthon continues some of his teaching in Wittenberg, but so does Karlstadt. Karlstadt, who becomes a radical. So already in 1521, we have what we would call the Radical Reformation. And uh, with respect to the Lord's Supper, he too is adamantly opposed to any idea of the sacrament as um, sacrifice. Um, he's completely opposed to these philosophical gymnastics, if you will, <laughs> that are used to describe how it is that Christ is present. Um, and he basically strips back the practice of the Lord's Supper to the words of institution and distribution. Um, he and then Munzer, who is also first influenced by Luther, and please understand, Karlstadt was one of Luther's teachers. Um, they, unfortunately, their their radical interpretations lead to um, social unrest, namely the peasants' revolt. So Luther is not in captivity, but sequestered in Wartburg, and he's knowing that this is happening and deeply, deeply disconcerted because that is not at all the direction that he wanted to go. Um, also, another first generation, if you will, reformer is Swingley. And Swingley, I have, um, so if it's, in, if it's highlighted in red, I say that's Kelvin. And if the text is in red, I suggest that's Kelvin-ish. Um, it's proto-Kelvin, if you will. The reform tradition has a whole continuum of um, understanding of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. You have those that are robustly sacramental. That's Kelvin. Kelvin is keen to say Christ is truly present. Somehow, profoundly, mysteriously, by the work of the Holy Spirit, Christ himself offers at the hand of the minister his very body and blood, the substance of himself, as food for our souls. But again, this is accomplished, and it's real, and it's true, unless you're going to call Jesus a liar who says, this, my body, his body has got to be present somehow. But we'll assent to mystery and the incomprehensible work of the Holy Spirit and say it's really and truly there as food for our souls. So Calvin is robustly sacramental. Um, in the quotations that you have, and we can look at those later, he talks about the reality of, 
that which the sign, the sacrament itself points to, is, um, is not just pointed to, but in fact itself proffered. It is in a manner attached to. And Kelvin, so um, eventually Luther's expression becomes in, with, and under. Luther affirms also radically the presence of Christ's body. Again, unless you're going to call God and Christ a liar, the body must be present. But he advocates a bodily consumption. He never, he, he, ne he repudiates transubstantiation. He acknowledges consubstantiation, but he never actually codifies that, puts that in a confession or um, specifically says, this is our doctrine, consubstantiation. But with that con, you can hear that with. And Kelvin is very close. He's very willing, Kelvin is very willing to say with and under, but not in. In sounds too much like it's contained. And Kelvin wants to say, it's, it's, Christ is in heaven. And this is, this is, swing. Christ is in heaven. He still has a body. He's incarnate. He, his resurrected body was, was incarnate. So somehow, profoundly and mysteriously, that is present in heaven, wherever heaven might be. And yet, somehow, by the incomprehensible work of the Holy Spirit, that body, Christ himself, offers to us by the Spirit with and under the bread and the cup. So these, these that I have in, and I don't actually quite have all of them, but in red text are proto-Kelvin. Okay, they're, so Kelvin is robustly sacramental, but then several of these are not so sacramental, and that would include Swingley. But this is the continuum of the Reformed tradition. So you've got robustly sacramental, follow me? And you've got, oh, no, 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 no. The sign and what it points to, the thing signif those are two different realms, and they do not intersect. So the sign points to the reality, but you cannot, Zwingli was very keen to say, you cannot bind the activity of God and the Spirit to this thing that the minister, this action that's taking place here. And Calvin says, wait a minute, who are we to question whether or not God can in fact accomplish this? So this is the continuum. It's a blessing and a bane, <laughs> if I may, for the Reformed tradition in a way. But Calvin is a second generation reformer so, um, again, you've got all this proliferation of ideas, 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 and there's a realization that, you know, if we're going to survive as a movement toward reform, we need to get our act literally together. And Luther was excoriating Swingley for his ideas, how can you say that Christ isn't present in substantial way? So Luther is excoriating Swingley. Swingley's more congenial, but he, he says, I, you can't go that route. Like it just, you know? So this is great. This is high drama. Um, Melanchthon and Bootser, who's, these two guys are much more conciliatory. And they're recognizing, listen, if we're going to survive as a movement, we've got to get our act together. So they collude. And they say, Melanchthon, you bring Bootser to Marburg. Excuse me, Melanchthon, you bring Luther to Marburg. And I, Bootser, will bring Swingley to Marburg. And we'll make them hash this out. Luther and Swingley didn't know that the other was going to be there. <laughs> and during the colloquy, I mean, Luther had an angular personality. He was a bit more volatile, a bit more in your face. Swingley, um, more pastoral, more congenial. They 
generated, I think it was like 10 or 12 articles, all of which they agreed on with regard to the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. But what they could not agree on is location, location, location. And so the colloquy actually failed. And at the end of it, Swingley sought some kind of conciliation with Luther. And Luther just rebuffed him, refused to shake his hand. Um, Swing, Swingley, by the way, dies in 1531 on a battlefield. He was a military chaplain, and he died on a battlefield in 1531. Kelvin is not even yet on the scene. So, but there continued to be a proliferation of ideas and efforts toward um, moving together for the sake of the movement. Um, 1530, the Diet of Augsburg, Melanchthon is the primary, the prince is gathered here and the theologians thinking that, oh, this is going to be an effort toward um, like a theological and practical conciliation between the Roman Catholics, the Holy Roman Empire, and those who are pressing for reform. And they get that, mm-mm. It was give this up and concede and become, again, part of the Roman Catholic practice and tradition. And Melanchthon drew up um, the Augsburg Confession saying, no, these are the articles by which we stand. Um, and it was there that it was obvious that the Protestants, which, by the way, is a name that was given to those who were pressing for reform. They didn't assume that name for themselves. It was given to them. I don't know exactly when it is that they kind of assumed it for themselves, um, but it was imposed on them. So at this point, it's very clear that the Protestants and the Roman Catholic Church will not conciliate. There will be a divide. But it's also apparent that the reformers themselves are splitting into groups. So you've got the Lutherans, those who are following Bootser, those who are following, well, especially those three. Two. Sorry. So you see there's this, this effort toward understanding the sacrament, not just for biblical theological reasons and practice and devotion, but also for military alliance. Okay, the last thing I want to point out, Kelvin comes on the scene in 1536. Um, Kelvin comes on the scene in 1536. Kelvin is not an easy read. And it's not because his writing is so dense. It's because he speaks out of two sides of his mouth. If you want to understand Calvin's doctrine of the Lord's Supper, don't begin with his institutes. Um, his institutes, he, he goes through several iterations of them, and all along he's adding content from his discussions. Okay, and check this out. Geneva, so this is, this is German Switzerland, and this is French Switzerland. This is where exiles... I think on your handout it says that Luther's ideas were being distributed and promulgated in Paris. Well, that didn't go down well. And anybody who was pressing for reform left France and headed east. And they, a lot of them ended up in Strasbourg, Basel, Geneva, Bern. So in the Swiss, the, the western Swiss portion. Well, Geneva is hanging out here all by its little old lonely self in this Roman Catholic domain. And he's thinking, if, if, worse, if the Roman Catholic Church and its political alliance start pressuring us, we need our own protection. And so he looked to the German Swiss. And it's in 1549 that he and Bullinger, Bullinger is Swingley's successor in Zurich, he and Bullinger get together and they come up with the consensus of Zurich. And for a long time, scholars would say, the consensus of Zurich, that's really Calvin's doctrine. Read that one. And it's not. What it is, is really, it, Calvin concedes as much as, this is as much as Calvin can say in order to, uh, to conciliate with Bullinger, but it doesn't say everything. So Kelvin wants to say 
Again, he's robustly sacram sacramental, right? These gifts are instruments that God, the Holy Spirit, uses in order to accomplish what's promised, namely Christ's body and blood being given our souls as food for the spiritual journey. He uses the word instruments. Bollinger cannot use the word instruments. He can't connect sign and thing signified in that way. So this consensus of Zurich, Kelvin is saying only as much as he has to in order to achieve this conciliation, but he's not saying everything. And it's in his defense of having signed on to this that you get more of Kelvin's um, own exposition of what this means. And of course, then you hear Kelvin as Kelvin. Do you have a question? that Kelvin is robust and, and, and the, uh, the Zwingli person cannot get behind it. What's the reason why he uh, cannot shift? Again, it's because there's this concern that if, if um, you say this is an instrument of the Holy Spirit, oh, then you're saying that somehow the Holy Spirit is subject to the action of the minister and is being bound to the action of the minister in setting forth the celebration. Does that make sense? And Swingley's like, oh, no, 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 no. We can't, we don't want to bind the Holy Spirit to anything. But is that what Kelvin's saying? Kelvin is saying that um, Christ's promise is true. So when Christ himself as host at this table sets forth bread and cup for our communion and says, this is my body. He says, unless you're going to call Christ the host at this feast, unless you're going to call Christ a liar, somehow it has to be body. Somehow it has to be that this bread does in fact convey as my word, but communicate is Calvin's word. Somehow it does communicate Christ's body and Christ's blood. And the Belgic Confession, which is, I don't have it on here, I have it on here. And I have it actually like super red. It's way over here because it's robustly Calvin and says, um, you know, the, the, our, our souls feeding with the hands and mouth of faith. So faith receives, right? And if you stopped right there, you would think, whoa, this sounds, right? But our souls feeding with the hands and mouth of faith truly receive not an empty sign, not a naked sign. That's also a, um, a frequent phrase. These are not empty or naked signs, right? Um, our, our souls feeding with the hands and mouth of faith truly receive Christ's body and blood. And how can this be? The work of the Holy Spirit. Um, so it's not transubstantiation because how far do we want to go? Yeah. So actually, let the Roman cat no, let the Roman Catholic Church speak for itself. So take that other handout. Okay, so on this handout, let me very quickly finish. Um, okay, so I said that Calvin speaks out of two sides of his mouth. Let me quick finish this part, okay? Um, so the, that is Calvin speaking like a Swinglian, more, more like this, right? And yet, um, this, this document, this best method, he's writing best method for securing concord, for securing agreement about the sacrament. He's writing to a Lutheran audience. And it's there that you get this robustly, I will, you know, it's Christ is conveying this, communicating this with and under the bread and the cup, but not in. In sounds too contained. I don't know what that means, in, under, with, I don't, I don't get that at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so Kel Luther wants to hold to there is a bodily consumption. Somehow, but not transubstantiation. Um, 
So let's let the Roman Catholic Church be, speak for itself. So in the fourth, fourth Lateran, so what I did is I replicated this continuum of divergence with these quotations. And it's, it's like, I just grieve to think of everything that I couldn't put on here, you know, like to, to fairly represent these traditions. But in any case, you, you can read, but so the Fourth Lateran Council is where transubstantiation became official doctrine in the Roman Church of the West. Um, there is one official church of the faithful outside which no one at all is in the state of salvation. In this church, Jesus Christ himself is both priest and sacrifice and his body and blood are really contained in the sacrament of the altar under the species of bread and wine, but bread being transubstantiated. So it looks like bread. It just looks like bread, but it's not bread. It's body. It's flesh. So on the level of substance, there's been a conversion. So then Council of Trent, 1563. Council of Trent is the Roman Catholic response to all of this foment. And um, what year is it? In 1551, they write on the, on the Lord's Supper, on the, on the Mass. This holy synod doth now declare it anew, right? So we're repeating what we said before. By the consecration of the bread and of the wine, a conversion is made of the whole substance of the bread into the substance of the body of our Lord, of Christ our Lord, and of the whole substance of the wine. So in this, this conversion is suitably and properly called transubstantiation. Um, maybe this would clear it up from the Belgic Confession. Um, moreover, though the sacraments and what they signify are joined together, not all receive both of them. The wicked certainly take the sacrament to their condemnation, but do not receive the truth of the sacrament, just as Judas and Simon the sorcerer both indeed received the sacrament, but not Christ, who was signified by it. So if transubstantiation is the case, then it doesn't matter how wicked you are, you're consuming the body and blood of Christ. Right, so this played out in the, in the Middle Ages, and I, I don't wanna get stuck in, in weeds, but I mean, you can, you can understand why once, with this doctrine, once the bread and the cup and the wine have been consecrated, um, they are forever consecrated. They forever contain, they're forever con converted into the body and blood. So they must be consumed by humans. And then they would have these debates. Well, what happens if a mouse gets a crumb? Um, and Is that the end? What? Is that the end? That's the end. Like super in, converted in, contained yeah, in. Under Luther, I... Yep. For just... For just as the bread is changed into his natural body and the wine into his natural blood, so truly are we also drawn and changed into the spiritual body that is into the fellowship of Christ. Yes, it's still bread, and yet it's affording a bodily consumption of Christ's body. And blood. Yep, yep, yep. And that's, and that's way here, and it may be that he, again, he may have tried to clarify, and he may prescind from that just a little bit, but um, his concern is that there's a, there's a bodily consumption still. Luther, but one, Luther. It is still bodily, yep. but somehow different than Trinity. Right, because it's not converted into at the a level of substance. Semantics. But not for nothing semantics. Like I said, we can only get paint chips, right? And these aren't even paint chips. Um, the Anglican Church is very interesting because in terms of polity and practice, it's, it's somewhere over here. But in terms of doctrine, it's actually much more um, swingly. It's reformed and even swingly. So it's not easy to capture that because Cranmer himself didn't write a whole lot, but you have the Books of Common Prayer, which were generated in 1548 to 1552. Um, and so I, I cribbed from a really wonderful book 
Do This in Remembrance of Me by Brian Spinks, published in 2013. Uh, the Eucharist from the early church to the present day. And he does a really good job of just helping us understand the historical theological context as well as what's at stake in terms of um, some, of these, some of these conversations and discussions. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll close with the conclusion of Farrell, though. Or, excuse me. Actually, yeah. So Farrell is French. And in his, so he's in the middle of the second side. And Farrell and Calvin worked together in Geneva. They were exiled. Calvin went to Strasbourg and then eventually came back to Geneva. Um, Calvin definitely was a, I mean, he obviously used Farrell's liturgy. Um, and in the distribution of the bread, this is what Farrell says the minister ought to say. Jesus the true savior of the world, who died for us and is seated in glory at the right hand of the Father, dwell in your hearts through his Holy Spirit, by whose virtue, by whose power, he gives himself and communicates himself to you, that you be wholly alive in him through living faith and perfect love. So do you hear the pastoral passion there? Like I'm talking about all these debates and all that kind of thing, and there's ultimately... There is so much pastoral passion. Um, and I wish I could, I could share more of that with you, but I'll, I'll leave that for now. I think I will turn you, it Sue. over to Thank you, Karen. Thank you for working your way through what is a very complex topic. Let me give you your notes so you have that. There you go. All right. So we are going to now move to the practice. And how was the Lord's Supper, how was the communion celebrated in these various churches in the midst of this complicated theology, right? What does it look like in practice? How does this actually work itself out? So um, I want to start with some important questions. Where and when and how often should the sacrament be celebrated? That's already an important starting point. All right, well, it depended which confessional group you were part of. If you were Catholic, every time the Mass was celebrated, that was a celebration of communion, of the sacrament of communion. That was the heart of the mass. That's what happens every single time. The priest consecrates the bread and the wine. It becomes the body and blood of Christ. And it is holy from that point on and venerated. Okay, it's very, very, very sacred. Important considerations then about how people receive the sacrament flow from the fact that it has been consecrated and that it is the body and blood of Christ for Catholic believers. If you were Lutheran, uh, your communion services would take place regularly um, in many churches every time there was a Sunday service. There would be a celebration of the Eucharist. And this is a rather nice panel from Denmark, right? Mm. 1561. And you look at the church first, you think, well, that's kind of Catholic looking. There's the crucifix with Christ on the cross. There's candles. There's an altar. It feels very Catholic. But you would know it was Lutheran because if you look, they're receiving both the bread and the wine. And Catholics, until Vatican II, right, until the 1960s, only received the bread. They did not receive the cup. And here's why. It's very holy. It's the blood of Christ. And a practical purpose of distributing elements to people. So the host is put, like this priest is doing, direct into the mouth of the faithful, whether you were Lutheran or Catholic, because it's holy. You're not supposed to be holding it, okay? They pop it into your mouth. But the cup, you can imagine the dangers of drips or dribbles or people, you know, somehow missing their aim when they're getting to the cup. And you do not want the blood of Christ on the floor. Okay, this is bad. So the priest would have the cup. The faithful would get the host, the consecrated wafer. And that was a full communion. That was considered a full communion. Okay, so you just have to understand how this works. So you would know this is Lutheran because both bread and wine. Okay, even the picture tells you that. And they're receiving kneeling. Do you see that? They're kneeling down to receive their communion. That's kind of how it's done. Okay, that's kind of interesting to see. Now, what if you were reformed? Well, if you were reformed, you had communion very infrequently, mostly at a quarterly celebration. So four times a year. Okay, so four times a year. What Sundays would they pick? Well, usually they picked the Sunday closest to Christmas. That's one. Easter Sunday, that's two. Pentecost, that's three. And then a Sunday in September, because that's the next kind of 
relevant yeah. time. It's not connected to anything. Okay. It was very interesting as to whether, especially the Christmas communion, was directly connected in people's minds to Christmas itself. Um, Calvin did not want to see that happen, and Knox following him the same. They didn't want people to think of the December communion as being like for Christmas Day, because Christmas Day was kind of downplayed as a feast day of the Catholic Church, but not something that Reformed people should put extra emphasis on because of, not so much we don't want to celebrate Jesus' birth, but because of what the Reformed leaders thought were superstitious practices that had emerged around the festivals of Christmas, all the partying, all the drinking, all that other stuff. You're not supposed to do that, so we're going to downplay that. So the Christmas communion was sort of disassociated, if possible, from Christmas Day itself. There's a very famous sermon by Calvin where he complains, interestingly, that too many people have come to church, which seems like an odd thing to complain about. <laughs> but what he's complaining about is that people have come because they're honoring Christmas and not because they want to necessarily be in church to hear the sermon of the day. So he's kind of trying to reorient their thinking about how they're actually coming to church and why they're coming to church. All right, so if you were then reformed, you're receiving it maybe four times a year. Um, if you are a Lutheran, you can receive it every Sunday. In practice, people didn't necessarily receive it every Sunday, but it was offered regularly. The same was actually true in the Anglican Church. The Church of England, the Sunday worship would involve the liturgy of communion, but you did not necessarily have to receive communion every single time. So there's kind of a difference between how often is it offered and how often is it received. If you were Catholic, you had to receive at least once a year. And people wanted to receive and were asked to receive in a state of grace, which means they have to have done their confession first. So the big time for communion, receiving communion as a Catholic was Easter, because people would do their Easter confession and then immediately go on to communion so they can partake in a state of grace. All right, so the practice of receiving communion regularly as a Catholic is a later development. The Mass offers it every time, the people do not receive it every time. Do you, are you following this? All right, cool, good, all right. So, what rituals form part of the sacrament? Well, this is interesting. What is supposed to happen during the distribution of the elements, during the ceremony itself? For Catholics, the holiest moment was when the priest pronounced the words of consecration. And that is when the miracle of transubstantiation occurred. And everybody in church would kneel down and bells would be rung. In fact, in some cities, they organized their masses such that they were in sequence in different parish churches. And if you were very devout, you could run from church to church to be present when the holy moment occurred and everyone would kneel down, the bells would ring, and that's the holiest moment. That's when you want to be there. Okay, so that was really a crucial part of the, of the liturgy, the ritual for Catholics was that holy moment. So partaking is less important. It's being present for the miracle that is really, really important. Okay, now if you were reformed, um, there's not this sort of miraculous change happening in the bread and the wine. Um, what is a significant part of the ritual and what is interesting is that especially the distribution would take place while someone is reading the account of the passion of Jesus Christ from the Gospels, right? They read the account of the Last Supper while the Supper is being distributed. So you get the Word of God and the sacrament operating simultaneously, right? So it's not totally silent. There's scripture reading going on while people are moving forward through the space to receive their bread and their wine. Um, one big controversy, and this is between the Lutherans and the Reformed, and has to do again with the understanding of the bread having the real presence of Christ in it, is during the ritual when the, the pastor says, you know, on the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and broke it. Okay, the Reformed pastors at that time would take the bread and break it as the words are being said. Jesus took bread and broke it and gave it to his disciples, breaking the bread. The Lutherans did not do that, okay? The Lutherans did not break the bread until they're actually distributing it to the people. It's not part of the ritual of the recounting of the Last Supper, okay? So it's called, in Latin, fractio panis, the breaking of the bread. And it's a mark of distinction 
between the Reformed and Lutherans. Is the bread broken when the words are said recounting the Last Supper? Or is it kept whole and then only broken for practical distribution? And they actually have quite big arguments about this. And again, just like I told the story last time about the Lutheran butcher who came with his cleaver to the baptism mm -hmm. to make sure the full Lutheran baptism was administered when the pastor was reformed. So there are debates in churches whether, you know, people might not understand the theology behind it, but they know, do we break the bread or do we not break the bread? And that's an identity marker for them. Our church does it this way. Other people do it that way. And we're not we're not in agreement over this particular point. Uh, smaller questions, should the bread be leavened, as in a yeast bread, or should it be like a cracker, right? Like matzah bread or something like that. So there's debates over that. Are you trying to be as close as possible to what Jesus did, at which point you want the unleavened bread, the cracker? Or do you think, well, that's not really significant. This bread is just kind of representative. So a, a yeast bread is fine. Okay, there's, there's all these debates to figure out. And then there's some really practical considerations. When you move from the wine is only for the priest to the wine is distributed to everybody, you suddenly need much more wine. Do you understand that? Okay, you need way more wine because everyone's got to have some, right? Well, that's fine if you're in France or even in the Swiss lands. They have vineyards. It's all good, okay? What if you're in Scotland? <laughs> Not too many vineyards in Scotland, guys. It doesn't really work too well. Okay, so what are we going to do? Because importing wine at great cost is difficult. There are accounts where the uh, communion in Scotland was done with whiskey. <laughs> Not with wine. <laughs> it's okay. It's good. Whiskey communion. That's all right. Because they have whiskey. They don't have wine. Right? You've got to think through these practical bases of changing things over. It's just how expensive it might be for a congregation to suddenly need barrels of wine for their, for their communions. Right? There's, there's, there's significant implications for changes. Okay. Um, one other issue that was interesting was... <sighs> When the, when the bread is distributed, so you imagine a congregation, imagine a big congregation, like think like 600 people, okay? Distribution, if only the pastor is distributing it, it's going to take a long time because 600 people have to file past the pastor, okay? So in some reformed areas, including in Geneva, they got the elders to help, okay? So the elders are part of that, and even sometimes the deacons could help, at least find the wine, pour out the wine, distribute that kind of thing. But some pastors in Geneva, and practically one particular pastor, objected strongly and said, no, no, it's the prerogative of the pastors only to do the celebration of the Lord's Supper. And that caused a huge fuss. Um, he ended up being expelled. His colleagues just thought, this is ridiculous. And he was a contentious man. He fought about everything. His name was Jacques Royer, and he ends up being essentially kicked out of Geneva and moves to France. And kind of there's a swirl of controversy wherever he turns up. He was that kind of guy. But the, the, the issue of the debate was, in whose hands is it proper to have not just the consecration, the, 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 the elements being distributed, but who, who's actually doing that? Is it just the pastor? Is it the elders and the deacons as well? There's kind of you know, issues about these kinds of things. Third question, how do people receive the sacrament? Okay, on the picture here, kneeling down, okay, with the host, the, the little, little wafers being put in your mouth or receiving it from the cup, okay. Um, as I said, Catholics only received the consecrated host directly into their mouths. They did not receive the wine. Uh, Protestants received communion in both kinds, both the bread and the wine. Um, Lutherans, generally speaking, came forward to receive. Okay, they move out of their seats forward to receive it. Um, they have some rather beautiful ones. It's not really very clear here. Um, because you can't really see the crowds, but one feature in Lutheran churches was what they called a vandal communion. Vandal is to wander. Okay, so how it worked. So imagine you're in your pews. Here is the altar in front, and it has an altar piece. Remember I showed you the Wittenberg altar piece with the, the altar and the altar piece? Okay, so you would come up. You would kneel down on one side of the altar to receive the bread. Then you would get up on your feet, you would walk around the back of the altar and come back over here on the other side now to kneel and receive your wine. And so people can kind of move through stations. That does usually require two pastors, right? One to give the bread on the one side and one to give the wine on the other. So just the, the logistics of distribution is, is kind of a fascinating question. How do you actually do that? 
Anglicans tended to come forward, and by the reign of Elizabeth, they kneel down at an altar rail, okay, at the front of the church. They kneel down, dunk, 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 and receive the bread and then the wine, and then go back to their places. In most reformed areas, people did also come forward, sometimes simply in a line to receive the bread, and then another line to receive the wine, but in many cases to sit down at tables in batches to receive the bread and the wine. So this is like recreation of the Lord's Supper, okay? We're going to sit at table together. So everyone sits down in a batch of about 10 or 12 people. The minister distributes the bread. The minister receives, distributes the wine. People get up, go back to their places. The next batch comes forward. Yeah, it'll take some time to get everybody through. Okay, that's, that's really quite interesting how it's actually done. All right, next set of issues. I don't know if you can see, this word says admissible. This is a communion token. Okay, we're going to talk about those in a moment. How does that actually work to get access? So, across the board, religious authorities wanted to make sure that when people received communion, they received it because they were worthily doing so. Okay, this, this idea of partaking worthily is very important. If you were Catholic, that meant having made your confession and being absolved by the priest before you received the bread from the, 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 the little host from the priest, okay? Um, if you were Lutheran or Anglican, most of the sort of access to the table, that's sort of done by the pastor. He has to have some sort of sense of people are in a worthy state before they receive the sacrament. This can get very awkward very quickly, uh, particularly in some Anglican churches where a pastor might try and remove someone from the altar rail as they come forward. Very awkward embarrassing for the person, kind of creating a bit of a stir when you want peace and serenity. It doesn't go down very well. Okay. The Reformed tended to be the most strict, apart from the Anabaptists, who have a whole system of, you know, dealing with discipline within the community quite stringently. But the Reformed are probably the most strict in terms of access to the table, trying to figure out how are we going to make sure that the person is in good spiritual and moral standing before they partake in the sacrament. Um, in Geneva, in Scotland, in France, this was done through consistories, okay, through bodies of church discipline who vetted the behavior and the morals and the spiritual life of their congregations. And without the agreement of these bodies, you may not actually partake in the sacrament, okay? If you're under discipline in some ways, you are not receiving that sacrament. And you could be under discipline for lots of reasons, behavior issues, moral issues, spiritual issues. There could be lots of reasons why you cannot partake. Um, in Geneva, in most cases, the, uh, the bar in receiving was temporary. In other words, the idea is that you fix the problem and then you can receive next time. And interestingly, the sessions of the consistory, which were once a week, really get very, very busy in the two weeks before communion, because everybody's <laughs> coming to sort themselves out from the problems from last time, to apologize, to get right, and then to be able to partake in the sacrament. In cases where there were big congregations or people were not necessarily 100% able to confirm you know, everybody's status, the use of communion tokens was a way to make sure that folks had been vetted. Often people would get their tokens because before the quarterly communions, there would be a visit from the pastor and an elder. And that elder and pastor would verify their spiritual knowledge, their moral behavior, you know, that there's no particular problems, and then would give them a token, okay? And when you come to church for communion, you hand in the token and that allows you in. Do you understand how that works? Okay. When I was in Scotland doing my graduate work, and this was in the early 1990s, um, we still had that, not with tokens, but the, the elder would visit. I got a visit from my elder like every quarter, and he would give me a little card at the end, little like, a, like it looked like a business card, but that was the equivalent of the token. Mm -hmm. Now, I never had to show it in order to receive it. It wasn't like they wouldn't let me come if I hadn't had it, but it was, it was the remnant of that tradition, okay, of having the token in order to partake, and that was definitely important. Now, some people who had a very strong moral sense would of themselves abstain from communion if they did not feel that they were worthy, okay? 
because they're having a problem, a quarrel, a, some kind of spiritual issue. They would sit it out. It turned out, especially in Geneva, the consistory didn't care for this. They didn't want people to autonomously and unilaterally decide for themselves that they were not in the right state. They wanted to be part of the solution, as it were. So if you, if you sat out from communion, you could expect a summons to the consistory to come and explain yourself. Why didn't you partake in it? And what was going on? Often then people admit to a quarrel, to an unresolved quarrel with a family member, with a neighbor. I'm angry at this person. I felt my heart was not in the right place. I could not partake. And then the consistory really tries very hard to get the people reconciled. They really see themselves as an agency of reconciliation. That this is part of their mandate. Okay. Now, being barred from the Lord's Supper by the consistory was definitely a, a, an embarrassment for people, right? Because if people move forward and you're the only one sitting there in your seat, everybody knows, okay? <laughs> Joe over there, uh-oh, he's, he's in a bad way, right? So it's very visible. So it's one of the reasons why people wanted to sort out their problem and get reconciled before the consistory so that they could partake. Because in a sense where in communities where personal honor was very important, not being able to participate was, was a sort of a, a mark against you. And if you can't participate in the Lord's Supper, there's other things you also cannot do. You may not present babies for baptism, for instance. You may not be a godparent. So it kind of restricts your abilities to be a full member of the community. They don't do shunning, okay? It's not like you, you that's more of an Anabaptist thing, but it's definitely um, hampering your, partic your full participation in the spiritual community of your, uh, uh, of your town. Um, one other question was, well, what if you're traveling? Okay, what if you're traveling from your home area and you wanna go to church somewhere else and it's the quarterly communion? Can you go or not? Interesting. Um, in many cases, churches then wanted some kind of certificate from your home church saying that you are a member in good standing before you can partake in their church, okay? so. This practice continued and has been a practice, especially in more conservative Presbyterian reformed churches. It's called fencing the table, okay? Making sure that the access is for those who have been either, have given evidence of their good standing within the congregation or have testimony from another church that they are in good standing before they participate. All right. Communion and reconciliation. So again, it's very interesting to see how important it was for religious leaders that people partake of the communion in a state of good relationship with God and with their neighbor. Uh, because in a sense with communion, what's happening is the whole people of God are in a special circumstance before the face of God, okay? You're bringing the communion together, bringing the community together for communion and it's, it's meant to be a holy moment. So you want to make sure that as many as possible are reconciled, that there are no festering quarrels or problems or, or issues of that kind. Um, but what's really interesting to me and I find fascinating is there are rituals that continue in the church that in spite of the push for reconciliation and harmony and you know peace and love and so on, show that Eh, the tensions that are still present in society don't disappear as soon as you walk into the church. Um, status markers do not disappear. Uh, and it's particularly visible when people line up for communion. Now you'd think, okay, you line up for communion, well, the, the, the right way to do it would be, you know, the people sitting at the front go first and then the next pews like back, that, that'd be like, like, you know how boarding an aircraft, it's the same idea. Let's just do it as logistically as possible, okay? <laughs> But in fact, um, what tended to happen was the social norms that applied outside the church also applied inside the church, which meant that people wanted to line up by order of their importance in society. So the leading citizens go first and at the tail end are the poorest members. And it's all the men first and then all the women, okay? But each time lined up in order of social hierarchy. Okay, so now it gets a little awkward. There's sometimes like, hey, you belong behind me, not in front of me, kind of shoves. Um, and there are cases where um, a certain nobleman would be coming up for communion and ordered that his wife should come immediately behind him because he's got status and she's got status, but she would then be ahead of all the men and that's not possible. So there's a little bit of, you know, shove, shove going on there. Um, and then really interesting 
issues where the norms of the church and the norms of society might clash. And this happened in France. So in Huguenot Reformed churches, there are some pastors who essentially said to women, noble women, that they were not dressed appropriately to receive the sacrament. In particular, that their dresses are too low cut um, and that this is not appropriate, okay? And the women who are Huguenot noble women, and they're part of the Reformed churches, they're members in good standing, their behavior is good, their morals are good. They say, wait a minute, I'm dressed according to my social status. I'm dressed the way my husband wants me to dress, which is a pretty powerful argument in a patriarchal society, right? And you cannot tell me that I'm dressed inappropriately because I'm dressed according to the status that I live by, right? So kind of, do you see here a tension going on between the pastor's ideas of morality and proper behavior, and especially these women coming forward and saying, oh, no, no, my dress is not an issue here. You still need to admit me. You still need to allow me to partake. It's kind of interesting. By and large, the pastors were forced to back down and allow these women to partake. Uh, they were not, their protests or their complaints were not upheld by the next level up in the church. They were told, no, no, these, these women can go ahead and, and partake. Now, one more issue I want to talk about, because I find it very, very interesting, is the question of communion mm -hmm. for the sick and the dying. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is it lawful? Is it appropriate? Is it permissible to bring the sacrament to the bedside of someone who is sick or dying? If you were Catholic, no problem. That's actually expected. It's the last rites, right? You know that. Extreme unction. This is what happens when you're on your deathbed. If you're Catholic, faithful Catholic, the priest would come, anoint the person, right? Give them a last communion, okay? Pray over them the whole nine yards. It's like totally what happens. It's exactly what happens. Um, in fact, in areas where there were confessional tensions, this is one of the points of tension because when the priest is coming to someone's bedside with the host, right? It's consecrated host. Everybody's supposed to, you know, bow, right? Or kneel down while the host goes by because it's holy, right? This is the body of Christ. And Protestants would not do that. And then there was, again, friction, uh, problems in the streets even. If you were Lutheran or if you were Anglican, yes, it is possible and indeed perfectly okay to have a communion at your deathbed or at your sickbed. There's, there's provision in the Book of Common Prayer, provision in the Lutheran church orders to bring the sacrament to the bedside of someone who cannot come to church for illness or because they're dying and so on and so forth. Generally speaking, the church orders for the Lutherans and the Anglicans did say that it should be more than just the sick person participating. In other words, you should have a community, having communion by the sick bed or by the death bed. Okay, not a private communion. They're a little not sure about that. But the household becomes like a mini church. Okay, and that's where you can do the sacrament and that's just fine. You can go ahead and do that. The Reformed were very much more divided about this one issue. Is it okay or is it not okay to bring communion to the bedside of someone who is sick, like not just a cold sick, we're talking like sick in bed, can't get out of bed sick, or someone who's dying, right? On the one hand, there were those who said, no, this is not okay. They said communion is only ever supposed to be in church with preaching, with the whole community present. And it's not something to be done outside. That's too Catholic. That's no, we don't do that. Okay, that's not okay. That was true among the Dutch Reformed. That was true among the Scottish Presbyterians. They were not okay, generally speaking, with sickbed or deathbed communions. They're not going to do that. What I find fascinating is Calvin in Geneva. The Genevan authorities had decided, no, they're not going to do sickbed communion or deathbed communion. But there are two letters from Calvin that said that he personally thinks it's actually a good idea. He's in favor of it. Okay, he says pastorally for the comfort that it brings for folks who cannot come to church, for folks who, you know, miss that comfort, that it is okay to bring them communion. He says, ideally, on the same Sunday as when the quarterly communion is being celebrated in church, because then you're kind of like just doing an extension of that. But even it sounds like at other times, again, so long as the key elements of a worship service are replicated. In other words, there should be some kind of preaching, maybe not an hour long sermon, but some kind of reflection, reading of God's word, preaching on God's word, and then the comfort of the sacrament, again, with the whole household, not just with the one sick person. 
And I find that very comforting, right? I'm, I'm glad to know that Calvin was of the point of saying, you know what, this is something that we should not remove from people. We should not take away this comfort from them. Uh, but as I said, other reformed groups firmly rejected it. The Synod of Middleburg in uh, the Dutch Reformed rejected it firmly in 1581. The Scots Presbyterians also, no, we don't do this, this is not okay. Um, but it's a really important question, I think, because it comes to the pastoral side of this sacrament, right? What is the purpose of this sacrament? And the comfort that it brought to people, I think, is something we don't want to forget. Amid all the theological discussion, we want to try and remember, well, what's at the heart here, right? It is the comfort of the presence of God, right? However it's understood. It is the comfort of the presence of God, strengthening you, feeding you, preparing you for all that lies ahead. And that, I think, is what needs not to be for, for, forgotten. Okay, time for questions, discussion, things you're still wondering about. Uh, either Sue or I are happy to answer any questions you may have or insights you'd like to share. Yes, go ahead. On the continent, architecturally in the church, mm -hmm. Do they have the same fight over, and I'm sorry, I don't know the term for this, mm -hmm. continental terms, but what they would call a rude screen or a cross screen in Great Britain? Do they have the same discussions over the rude screen? So the rude screen is this, this wall that I was talking about before that divides the nave from the choir. Okay, so think about a cross-shaped church. Okay, think the long arm, okay? There's like a screen, and it's sometimes wood, sometimes stone, okay? In Catholic churches, that's what divided the nave from the choir and the high altar, okay? And it would be decorated, and there would often be a crucifix on top or statues of saints and so on and so forth. Quite ornate, quite lovely. So in England, there's a lot of debate about that. You know, they take them down, they put them back up again, depending on who's on the throne, it's back and forth, okay? Okay. Um, most continental churches removed them when they reconfigured the church for reform worship in particular. Now, Lutheran churches would have had less issues with that, right? So, but reformed churches reconfigure the whole interior, remove the altar, and remove that screen at the same time. Okay, that's just gone. And the focus is the pulpit. And when they do communion, they then bring out like folding tables. If they're going to have people sit around it, you get the folding table out, and that's where you celebrate the Lord's Supper. Yeah. Yes. I know this is in the context, uh, content and context of early modern worship, but I feel like COVID has forever changed the celebration yeah. of the sacrament of Holy Communion. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if um, you'd be willing to give some advice and counsel on how, how, uh, how we might faithfully maintain the integrity of uh, what we're participating in with the real reality that people are afraid. I know. Um, I know. Not everybody. I mean, and some of them, quite frankly, rightly so, people must have experienced mm -hmm. in the last couple of years. But how do we, how do we, um, how do we help people? So I think that's a very good question. The question is how pastorally do we help people after having gone through COVID? How do we kind of figure out how to celebrate the sacrament and bring it in a way that's both reassuring to people, but also builds that community. But you just said the comfort of the presence of yep. God. I mean, mm -hmm. just... Yep. Yeah. Absolutely, 100%. So I've seen it done in different ways. I have seen in Anglican churches, especially at the height of COVID, where the common cup was really not a good deal, okay, where essentially they moved to what would you think of as a more pre-Vatican II Catholic teaching, where they said, you get your whole communion when you get just one part of it, okay? Even if you just get the bread, the host, you've still got the full communion. So I thought that was interesting. That was one way of explaining pastorally to say to people, don't feel like you've missed out if you haven't had the cup, right? You're still getting the whole sacrament. Okay. Um, but in places that people are used to having both the bread and the cup, then it gets a little more challenging. So I don't know if anyone here has other... These I've seen those, yep, mm-hmm. I've seen those. It, it feels weird in some ways. It feels very much like, you know, your own single serving of something. Yes. A lot of this has to do on how high or low your understanding of Eucharist is. So yep. my Episcopalian uh, priest in town had went through all sorts of conniptions mm -hmm. about common cups and breads and consecration. Whereas I, when we, we did it on Zoom, I said, 
get out some fruit of the vine, whatever that might be, and get out whatever kind of bread you can find, mm -hmm. and there we go. Yeah. Um, so it, it really, a lot of it has to do with, again, your theology yep. mm -hmm. of, mm -hmm. of communion. I think, I think that is one aspect of it. I think the other one is simply just bringing people back together already as a start. That's already key, right? Mm -hmm. Because I think you can have communion in different ways. The mechanics of it, we can probably figure out. What we've lost, I think, during COVID is the sense of we are the body together in the presence of God. And that's what I think a lot of churches are still struggling with, honestly. John. Just another, another point that's worth remembering is that ideal theological and ministerial and pastoral practice is one thing, but the church has always had a category, often not well advertised, even at seminary, for emergency theology. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you do things this way because it is the best you can do. So yep. there are categories for emergency baptism, and so I've told some of my students, we have now we have to look at category for emergency Eucharist, mm -hmm. and recognize this isn't ideal, but you know, explain yep. it to the people, and then move forward with it. That's really, really helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. I'm intrigued by the same kind of question. What do we do now, and what were practices of the past that, that had that sense of community? I had never heard about the Reformed tradition coming forward and sitting together at tables. Mm -hmm. Um, I've seen, like yep, that? yep. I mean, even my church here. So I go to Woodlawn CRC that meets here on campus in the university chapel. You've been in that space probably. It's like the big round, mm -hmm. where you were like a couple of days back for, for Vespers, okay? And our church, the table is there and it can seat maybe about 10 people. And not every communion, we have communion once a month, but not, but I would say about half of the time, uh, so six times a year, a, a particular elder, is asked to ask people in their district, and it has to be a mixture of couples and single people, to come sit at the table as a representative group of the whole community. You see that? So the pastor is there, and obviously everyone else is getting the bread and the wine throughout the congregation, but those 12 people, or however, are sitting around the table, passing the bread along, passing the cups along, and it sort of, in that way, embodies, right? And that's really nice. If your church architecture allows for this, I recommend that idea. And it's a nice way for people to feel really part of things, right? If you're one of those 11, 12 people, it's it's very meaningful. Very, very meaningful. Yeah. John. Uh, I'm wondering if you could comment on this. I'll, I'll introduce it by, uh, it's a question of vocabulary. I come at this as a uh, Presbyterian minister of Word and Sacrament and as a professor, having taught Presbyterian students, confessions and creeds and so on. And I, on the topic of the Lord's Supper, I urge them to be able to be conscious of the history of this discussion and for that reason to avoid referring to the bread and the, well, heaven forbid it should be wine in our denomination, but fruit of the to referring to this, to referring to the, the bread in particular as the host, because even as we like to think of Christ as the host of the table, mm -hmm. the, yeah. the same word Latin host means victim. Mm -hmm. and implies you have a, 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 a notion that this is a re-sacrificing of Christ. Right. So right. There, there, right. There, are, there are some words and some gestures that are innocently entered into, like referring to it as, as host, mm -hmm. or after breaking the bread, lifting it up. I say, well, you can lift it up, but don't get it above your shoulders because that's also a sacrificial gesture. And mm -hmm. you, you may not understand what your theology is, but other people will see this, and, and especially professors who are... You know, scrupulous about this. <laughs> but you know, do you do you find this language used with or without precision through the traditions you've studied? I think it varies a lot, and um, you know, part of it's translation issues too. Because if the original texts are in Latin or in French or in some other language, and then someone translates them into English, you know, how careful there's there's translation precision that is a an issue, right? And it often depends then also on the background of the translator, which terms they're more likely to use. But I agree with you that um, within a tradition, certain wary, words or certain gestures carry a weight that one might not be aware of. Um, again, I think for me, the most important, and, and there's been some interesting work done on this, um, we have, particularly in some reformed circles, gotten to, and, and Leonard van der Zee has written an article for us on the Calvin Theological Journal on this, an understanding of the sacrament of communion, which is simply remembrance and nothing more. And I think he's right in saying we need to get away from that. Because if we're just remembering, it feels very flat, right? Spiritually kind of very thin, as it were. 
So um, this sense of even Zwingli, I would argue, is not simply remembering. He is saying something happens in the community of the faithful yeah. when we gather at the table of the Lord. And I think that's kind of where we need to do more. We need to think as we celebrate, as we participate in our worship services at communion, what is it exactly we're trying to convey, right? If it's simply, well, okay, yeah, this is a thing we do four times a year and just sit through it. You'll get through it soon. You get a little bit of bread, a little cup. But unless we can give it some more heft, I think, in terms of what are we doing in bringing the community together in the presence of God in a particularly special way, right? That this needs to be taught more. I, I agree with that. I think at this point, I'm going to call the session to a close because I don't want to keep you from your coffee. But if there's further discussion, please just stay on and discuss if you like. And we have some of our rare books out again if you want to look at those. We start up again for our next session at 10.30. Thank you all very much. All right. <laughs>